In today's episode of HR Visionaries, we talk to Haley from Crowd. We talk about how important it is for HR leaders and talent acquisition leaders to know about the business of the company. Stay tuned. Welcome to HR Visionaries, where we unlock the secrets of modern HR. I'm Benjamin, your host. Join us as we shed light on today's HR universe with HR leaders and innovators from across the globe. Whether you're an HR pro, a business leader, or just curious about the future of work, this is your shortcut to the forefront of HR innovation. Brought to you by Hire, the AI talent attraction platform. Welcome to our latest episode of HR Visionaries. I'm looking forward to my guest today. Haley. thanks a lot for taking the time. Thanks, Ben. So great to chat to you today. Um, I'm excited to see what we're going to talk about and what we're going to unpack and explore within the space. Me too. And um, well, as, as always, I would ask you, could you just give us a brief intro? Who are you? Where do we start? This is, this is a big <laughs> book. Um, so I'm Haley. Haley Day. I um, I'd like to consider myself as a talent professional. I started my career in basic recruitment, fundamental recruitment, probably about 10 years ago. I think everyone says that they always just fall into recruitment. It's a thing. It really does happen. Um, when I finished school, grew up in South Africa my whole life, born and raised When I finished school, I was very excited to go and travel the world. And I did the whole gap year thing and, and traveled for just over a year, came to the UK um, and work and traveled and just had my best, the best time. Um, so that when I came back home, I was ready to really get focused and settled. And that's when I kicked off my further education at university. I studied a um, BCom degree in industrial and organizational psychology. Um, and then from there, I did a postgrad and I did my I achieved my honors degree um, similarly in industrial and organizational psychology. So I think always having that sort of nuanced interest in the, the business psychology side of things, um, especially always OD, organizational development has always kind of rung as a passion for me. So I think that's where it initially fell into recruitment. Um, started in the traditional side, agency side for a couple of years, loved it, but very quickly realized I need to be internal. I need to start seeing how the cogs are moving, seeing how that what that impact looks like in terms of embedding talent, or finding talent, embedding talent, seeing what that looks like from a succession perspective and how that, of course, all attributes to that value proposition around talent acquisition and 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 brand positioning ultimately within the market in terms of what that business looks like um, so that's always had a bit of a weighting towards od i think i've always kind of worn the, the the recruitment and the talent hat but always fundamentally see how does that then contribute to what we're trying to achieve from a strategy point of view in terms of broader wider business goals um, so from from external I went internal I've been in quite a few different industries in South Africa. I worked for professional services, a global law firm. I then worked for um, one of the biggest national transport companies. So I've had very different insights and in different in terms of ways of working, best practice around finding talent, what that looks like within different industry. Um, and then a couple of years ago, two and about two and a half years ago, made the move back to the UK. And I'm working for the most incredible digital marketing agency now um, that is just really ambitious and innovative in the space overall um, in terms of what we do. But it's been great to really leverage that in terms of bringing in the talent lens from a people perspective of how that drives the strategy forward as an agency as well. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour in terms of where I've been, my experience. Um, and Yeah, I don't know. is there anything specific that you'd like to 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 know perhaps about the certain industries that I've been in or, or more so where I am now? I think the digital space has been really exciting. Um, lots of changes, lots of developments. Absolutely. And there, uh, well, I definitely need to know more about this, given, uh, well, you said you, you worked for law firms, um, um, service industry, uh, transportation, now tech. So why tech? 
very interesting question. I don't, I, again, think I fell into it. <laughs> um, very much a part of the, the professional services industry was really around spearheading actually a shared services environment um, off the back to professional services around a, a, a global network identifying talent within the market that looked quite different to the UK market and really creating this skills hub of support. Then again, I said moving to, to transport, very different. And I think tech has always been in the back of my mind as being very progressive, very evolutionary. Um, and I think that's always kind of resonated with who I am as an individual as well. Very, always wanting to, to fast track in terms of development, understanding of nuances within market, the way people's minds work. And I think that's quite avid in this kind of industry. And again, tied back to that psychology side of things, it's a really great opportunity to see how that all then comes together. Well, then uh, in the transportation industry, if, um, if I may, I would want to go back to this uh, perhaps uh, for, for, yes. for a bit. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of approach you take then in terms of recruiting well in a transportation industry compared to the tech industry given well blue color hiring works very different from um very specialized tech hires um how did you find the uh the oh, how how's the difference for you um in terms of how you approach your everyday work It's a really good question, and I think there is such a difference in it. And I think, again, what the most important thing to do is coming into any new industry is really understanding that industry. And I think that always goes back to the very core of understanding the people that are in that industry. And once you understand that, I think that then brings on the shift in, right, so this is what good really looks like with it, within the industry. How do we then map that out in terms of a wider hiring strategy um, to, to make sure that we're maintaining that delivery of output. So there was a lot of blue collar hiring, which was again, very different coming from a professional services environment where we're looking for, you know, some really qualified people within the legal fraternity to now balancing it out to, there was, there was obviously white collar and blue collar employment, but at the blue collar, a lot of that sort of high volume recruitment, mm -hmm. but still making sure that you don't drop the ball in terms of the quality of people that you're bringing in. So it's always around the forecasting of growth within, whether it's channels of finance or marketing, or if you're looking for drivers or warehouse managers, there is still a quality of individual that you'd look for to make sure that they're still, whatever role they're stepping into within that business, be it at a very senior C-suite level, or even as a very entry level person or just a driver delivering a parcel that I think ultimately they're still believing in the vision of that business and that their values align with the, the, the values and the culture of the business. And that, that it sounds so easy, actually. Well, oh, if you believe in the same thing, then you can come work for us. But it really is being able to be in a room and pick those interests and passions out and see where they resonate. And then obviously coupled with that behavioral competency, making sure that those technical competencies are there as well. So it seems like a, a, a simple approach, but it is a bit of a lift and shift, I suppose, in, in every environment. Um, but cultures are also very, very different within that. So it's getting to the grips of that, understanding that, but also at the same time, understanding, like I said, at the, at the top of this, what the business need is, what that culture is, and then also understanding what is really important to the individual, irrespective of what job title they have or what position they're, they're looking to be in. Um, I, I think it's incredibly interesting given, um, well, um, many tech companies uh, are, well, occasionally in a bit of a bubble, right? So when you yeah. think, okay, well, the world is just tech, it's just white color. Um, however, it's so incredibly important to, to also get, uh, well, blue color hiring, right? As you said, um, so you need people who share your values as a company and you then need to communicate those values and well, exchange views on those. Um, how uh, how was it back in the days when you did um, a volume hiring? So so how did you communicate those those values, the vision um, to to new hires? It's funny. We had a a workshop yesterday with Coventry University. Actually, we were presenting to the digital marketing students, and again, it just resonated throughout the journey in my career that. We're talking about the things that actually haven't really shifted, you know, 
And I mentioned to because culture and values is something that I believe so strongly and I wouldn't be mm -hmm. able to be in the, in the role of the position that I'm in if I didn't firmly believe and buy into the culture and values. And that's why it's always been a really important factor for me in, in any business that I join in my career, because being at the forefront of those engagements with candidates, with networks, mean networks mean that you actually have to buy into that and believe it yourself. And it goes beyond just seeing a poster on the wall saying, this is what our values are, this is what our culture is. And if you walk past it, oh, that's what it is. And it's, it's, it's evolved so much from that where it's actually got to be something that is part of your brand, is part of your value proposition. And it's inherent in terms of the day-to-day, -day, in the office environment, in the way that we speak to our colleagues, in the way that we speak to our teams, in the, gauge of, in the way that we engage with both internal and external talent. So I think it's something that's not necessarily transcripted on paper or on posters, but something that actually lives in you and, and then people can see and resonate coming through in conversations and um, coming through in the way we deliver work to our clients. Um, and again, rippling, not necessarily something that is set at the top and, and brought down and tried to get everyone to buy into, but something that's recognized and brought into at every level. Um, and the actual people on the ground are the ones defining that as well, you know? So it becomes really easy to live that then. I, I totally hear you, uh, but it sounds much, much easier than it actually it is, does. right? So we'll, um, we'll let's have like a common understanding amongst everyone. Um, well, a root uh, from the roots uh, it, we we kind of built that culture together but that's difficult right it is difficult and i think if i take if we talk about where we are at the moment in this tech space and within digital marketing crowd for example was is, is i'd say still a relatively new agency um but we've been around for about 13 going on 14 years now and when we started We were a very small startup agency with our two founders, Luke and Ben. Funny enough, at that time, Luke was actually ex-Google. So I think a lot of that initial culture had really narrated across in terms of what they were quite keen to establish and, and create and maintain here at Crowd. And it's been very interesting because we've been on quite a ambitious growth trajectory over that time, so much so that... 13 years down the line, we've, we've broken the back of now our 500th employee, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and that coupled with, we, we can touch on more of this as we go, with our partnerings with this very unique global network of freelancers, which is actually at the core, our USP as a business. So taking all of that in and considering that massive and, and, and fast growth and scale, I think makes it even harder to retain a culture. I think with, with businesses, with companies that are growing and scaling so quickly, in my experience, it sometimes tends to be at the offset of something, which is typically either your people or your culture. And I think why I love the space that I'm in so much at the moment and why I love crowd is because we've been really invested in making sure that we don't compromise our bottom line in terms of what we feel makes us incredibly unique and special from a culture perspective and from a people perspective. So our employee value proposition, I think, has successfully been our driving force in terms of making sure that we're very deeply rooted around our people being our biggest asset. So it, yes, it sounds easy. How do you get that culture right? But I think it's when it's ideated and when it's kind of formed and carved out at the beginning, making sure that that continues through the trajectory in line with the strategy and the scale Of course, it can't be siloed in saying this is what our culture is and it, we want it to stay like this forever. But keeping those fundamentals there and evolving with it as the strategy and the scale comes into play and keeping those those core issues that always made us really unique and special. That's what people buy into. Um, and it's always easy to say that this is what it looks like. But when you can actually, you know live, eat, breathe, feel that, that comes off in the market and, and, and within our teams. And I think that's why we have some really good um, tenure within our business as well. You know, in tech and digital marketing, people say the churn rates tend to be quite high. And I think we've we've done really well. And I think that speaks to to that culture in terms of how we're getting it right, because we actually see that in, in, in terms of how people stay and continue to develop. Um, I really to go back to the industry knowledge you uh, mentioned mm. before. Um, 
which also, um, well, occasionally sounds much easier than it actually is, right? So to fundamentally understand where do those people we as HR leaders hire come from? So what is their background? What do they actually want um, in life? What do they want from, from my job? So what? how they, do they feel the industry? Um, uh, well, being being a banker uh, for, for some, for quite a number of years. Uh, so there was obviously the uh, time when everything was, was super amazing. And then there was times when it's, things are gloomy. So all this you need to incorporate in how you then approach people and well educate them about your company exactly that and i think the way of working has changed so much um my approach I, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna say something and then i'm gonna park it and come back to it but i'm generally quite disruptive in my thinking when it comes to talent strategy and talent acquisition and my team who are also remarkable have really bought into that there's always been this archaic way of thinking that, yes, we want to hire the best people who's going to add, who are going to add the best value. And yes, that's important. But we need to balance that out with, yes, let's get that amazing talent in. But what are we then doing to contribute to their career, professional, personal development as well? And that well-rounded holistic solution is really what allows us to bring in the best talent and incorporate that then as part of our retention strategies and our, our, our success strategies from a commercial perspective within the business. So, so let me park that back to your question around how do we then identify that talent? I think the disruptive thing is, and, and some people might raise an eyebrow at this, but I always look for passion. And that doesn't mean that passion has to come from an extroverted personality characteristic. I think it's always about, and whether you've got five years of experience, 10 years of experience, or five months of experience, or even new into the industry, I think it says a lot about a person when they've been really proactive in terms of their own development around identifying what it is that makes me excited, what I'm interested in, what am I passionate about. And when I see that passion around the same things that we as a business are passionate about, I immediately know that that then ticks off 80% of them going to be able to fulfill this role really well. Um, and that's those are the things that we, we can work with. But then there's the other challenge, I suppose, because we're, we're sitting in a market where there are more jobs than there are people. So it becomes a little bit more challenging <laughs> in terms of does it become this, this sort of fight for talent and especially in our kind of industry where you've got this big competition for, for talent within channel specific roles, tech roles, and you've got other agencies fighting for that. So does that mean then it all comes down to do we put all of our emphasis on our, our, our total compensation package? Is that how we bring people in? Do we pay higher base salaries? You know, mm -hmm. and I think what we've done really well is learned that it's it's nothing in isolation. You can't look at salary in isolation. You can't look at remote working in isolation, which I know has become another thing that's become quite important for people since the pandemic. Again, have a theory on that that I think is evolving as well. But I do really believe that your sort of value proposition, your culture do still sit at the forefront of all of that. People being able to buy into something. So I think if we... I know that when we when we're advertising roles and we're looking for certain levels of skill, yes, when we go out into market, we try and identify that first. When we find that, it then becomes that negotiation of why this is why we want you to work for us. This is what we can offer because we do have to stand out in the market. You know, so it's it's around our social offerings, it's around our cultural offerings, it's around our diversity, equity and inclusion um, initiatives that we have in place. Um, it's around our hybrid working. It's, it's all sorts of these things that, again, fall part of our overall employee value proposition that I think that solidifies how we find that talent. Because the talent's there, but it's the competition for it. Um, I have another question around what you just mentioned or what you meant before with regards to um, incorporating a completely different layer of complexity with freelancers who work yeah. for you. Um, and, and well, with those people that work for you on a permanent basis, obviously um, establishing a culture is not easy. However, once you when, once it's there, everyone can live this culture. So when you bring in freelancers, that adds a completely different level of complexity, I guess. 
Absolutely. And a really good question. And I think even now I still think, how is this something that we've managed to, to do so right? And I think because our we call them our crowdy network, very original name, Ben, I know. But I think... <laughs> can, can you say again? Uh, our crowdy network. Oh, crowdy network. Crowdy okay. network. I think because our network has always been our USP as a business. It was it was carved out when we when we opened our doors 13 years ago. So we got the essence of it right then. And the idea behind it was that it's always allowed us to be very agile in terms of how we've been able to scale as a business. And that's both scaling up or scaling down very quickly, depending on what the need is. So because that culture was always embedded from day dot, getting those crowdies brought into that. Um, has been very important. And it's never just been, a, here's an open network, come in and join. We have our own proprietary tech that has really leveraged the way that we're able to engage with these freelancers, get them signed on, and, and how we vet them as well. So it's been remarkable from both sides because what it's meant from an FTE perspective is, is that we can really upskill our internal teams very quickly by getting them to focus on things like strategy and partnership with our clients. But while they're able to task out certain areas of work within the network, but at the same time allows us to get access across the globe, over 118 different markets. So we get some really good insights, consumer research across the globe that really drives our decision making as a business, allows us to partner a lot better with our clients because of the insights that we get. And also tap into other areas like um, localization, trans creation, and some other very specialist skills. So tied back to your question, well, how, do, how does that then not compromise the culture? I think because our vetting process is so robust and our overarching principles of being a very high performing, diligent culture means that we, we vet the right skill level of, of crowdies within the network. We trust the work that they deliver, how we task that work, and we build those relationships in terms of we know that this person is really good with that. Um, we've got this person sitting on, on a boat in Romania and they're amazing and deliver, you know, so it makes us again very agile. But the amount of skill and talent that we're able to bring in and diversify our thinking and, and, and our team's upskill capabilities has just been incredible. So I think <clears throat> the vetting process, how work is tossed out within our network, Q&A by somebody else within the network makes it really thorough and, of course, not compromising our culture. Um, you mentioned engagement several times already. So to engage freelancers, to engage employees um, when communicating your employee value proposition to potential candidates or to, to applicants, it's it's a lot about engagement. So um, can you tell us a bit more about this? How do you communicate this given, well, I understand culture plays a very essential role mm -hmm. at, at Crowd, but it needs to be communicated, right? Given, uh, yeah. well, just people can't, can't just know it. Yeah, exactly that. And I think that comes down to that initial candidate experience. I always say to, to my team, this is our bread and butter as a team. This is what we are responsible for. And I think setting the right tone from the onset in terms of that initial engagement. So the way that we receive applications, the access that, that we that, that we give in terms of that equal, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunity for access and availability for people to apply for our roles right through to then when we first communicate. I think it's it's a balance between being really timeless, making sure that people are recognized, that they're seen, that we feed back at every level, keep people informed. Um, and again, that's both at an entry level roles that are applying to, to more senior roles. I'm a very strong believer in making sure that that experience is very personable. Um, and that if they're buying into me as a brand, as a personal brand, they're buying into our business because that, that that's the same brand. So that passion coming through from myself and my team and the wider talent uh, team is really important. And I think sets the tone for the way that we engage. And I think when people respond in a similar way, that's how we know that we're creating that engagement. So that candidate experience is, is really important. Um, 
feedback, transparent communication, keeping that whole process seamless and making sure that, again, we're feeding back at every single level. Um, we do like to take it a step further as well. And even if people aren't always successful in our roles, making sure that we give useful feedback in terms of, again, their professional development, mm -hmm. their personal development in a very constructive way. Um, and I think that also then embodies our vision for making a difference and an impact around talent within the industry. Um, and then again, create those networks for us get bigger because sometimes they, they go away and get other experience for the next six to 12 months and they come back and it's great because they're, they're ready for us and we're ready for them. So, and that's just the ripples across, across industries. And I think that's what I mean around engagement. It's, 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 what what they used to, what was that movie? Pay it forward. Do you remember that pay it forward movie? It's it's it, it sounds yeah. like such a silly analogy. It's an older movie, but it's a lovely movie. And I think that the principle is just paying it forward, um, giving an opportunity, making an impact means that that person then goes and does the same, and the person that they do that to does the same, and that's how we create this network of engagement. Ah, wasn't it like okay, you um well. You do something for two other people, and that's kind of like a spread yes. around, so it grows yes. exponentially. Then something 100%. like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 therefore, well, communicating well with all kind of stakeholders, I think, is so essential. Given, well, maybe they they also switch to the client side, right? Or go become Absolutely. Uh, become your, your buying persona. Like Exactly. It might sound like a, a bit of a naive approach, but it's very much of put the behaviors out there that, that you want to see in return. And I think that's also why our environment is so positive and high performing in general, because everybody believes in that. And, and having this environment of straight health, straight talk, healthy conversations, transparency breeds a culture of of trust and, and again, engagement, which is such an invaluable thing to have. Well. Back when you studied psychology in university, um, was that something you envisioned, or are you going, or well, are you going back to the university days in your mind nowadays quite often? Gosh, I think about it often. I, ha I often have conversations because I think with talent and even talent acquisition, I don't. I believe it's evolved so much and it's not now just about getting people in the door and then handing over to the rest of the people team or whatever that looks like. And part of my role is making sure that that journey with our employees is still really personable. So, I mean, just having a check in with somebody today and talking about that and thinking like, can't believe we hired you over a year ago. And I mean, I love seeing that growth and development, even opportunities for global mobility in terms of upskill. It's just a It makes my heart really fuzzy. It sounds silly, but I love seeing that. And I often go back to thinking of things like what I studied around abnormal psychology, about brain functioning, and all of these things tie in, I think, from a personal level to seeing this with other people, how they develop as well. So, yes, it's funny. I always I always draw myself back to what I learned with, with my honors degree. I've been dabbling for the last couple of years now thinking I must go and complete my honors, uh, my master's. But, you know, that that goalpost keeps moving. But it's incredibly rewarding to to balance a, a talent and a people strategy and, and even that overarching recruitment approach with the human psyche and understanding how that then falls into place, um, you know, from a development perspective, understanding. And I suppose that's where the organizational psychology and, and the organizational development pieces come in. Tying that in with the with the individual, uh, the individual psyche versus the business psyche, and seeing how we can get the most out of that, it's incredibly fascinating. Well, you, um, it's super interesting given that that was something I, I wanted to to ask you as well. Um, so you, you mentioned the strategic perspective of well, what you do as a company, and then what you do as as talent acquisition. Um, so um, understanding the industry, understanding the company, understanding where the company is going, um, how important is that for your for your job? I think it's incredibly important. Um, I do still believe, and I think this is 
even the founders of the business who are still very much involved in the business are very much aligned to believing that and, and, and supporting that our people are our biggest assets. And I think we can't continue to grow and scale successfully in the way that we have been if we don't continue to maintain that as our focus. So the way that we hire people, the way that we hire the right people and retain those people is going to be paramount in terms of how we continue to grow and scale, which is something that we as a business are incredibly passionate about. Because I, I think it's so incredibly interesting that, well, people drive strategy and strategy also drives people, right? So so it's like yeah. a vice versa um, situation um, where you then also, well, as a company need to define whether HR slash talent acquisition is like on the, well, is where, where, where it sits in the car, right? So in a driver's seat, uh, probably the... Um, Uh, well, I, I ideally, uh, a strong CEO or a strong leadership team knows where to go to, but then assisting in, well, in the course of, of, of travel um, yeah. is, is perhaps what talent acquisition and HR can do then. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. We, we had a debate about this as a, as a team a couple of weeks ago saying we've done so much work in our business over the last couple of years in terms of redefining what HR looks like, moving away from that traditional connotation of, you know, HR people being blockers to, to what the business is trying to achieve and actually being really important partners mm -hmm. to the business. Mm -hmm. So working alongside in partnership. And so we've done a lot of work around that through business acquisitions that have come into play. So we now operate as a group so we spent a lot of time around centralization, integration. Um, I always talk about this ecosystem of cultures that come with acquisitions or partnerships, which is also so important. But again, going back to that work that we've done in terms of partnering with the business has been just pivotal in terms of understanding the direction. So I don't think that you can ever look at, at a, as a strategy in silo for any, any, any department within a business. Um, and I think what makes us really successful, again, is the fact that we identify what our overarching strategy and goal and objectives are for the business. And then we look, right, how does people, the people team, the talent team, um, the finance team, our actual client driven teams, income generating teams all feed into that, obviously at different levels. But I think when everybody's clear on what that looks like from a top level and how they feed into that individually, And having that clear strategy makes such a difference with in terms of everybody understanding how they're involved, how they contribute to that. And it's again makes just makes such a difference. How do you do this in practice? So um well, being aligned with senior management is obviously incredibly important. However, um this well talking to senior management, um, senior management having, having an open um, uh, having open ears for, for the needs and also the challenges of recruiting and HR. Um, mm. That is, of course, necessary, however, not always a given, however, not always a given, right? Absolutely. And that's also a really good question. I think we're very lucky in the fact that we've got a very um, diverse thinking leadership team where they are open and receptive to feedback. It might also be that I'm quite um, bolstery in terms of you will sit down and you, you, you will hear my advice. <laughs> But I think that comes a lot with the confidence that you have within your own remit and with their own expertise. Um, I can be quite convincing, <laughs> but beyond that, I think really understanding your own individual brand and value proposition and how that then integrates with the wider business strategy. As soon as you can start talking at those levels and not talking about it again, a siloed strategy, but this makes sense because this feeds into what we're trying to achieve here and here. That's when you start getting the right people in the room, listening and buying into that. So. There's always a challenge because everybody has different priorities, you know, trying to balance BAU on, it, on every single day, plus the, the, the you know, the individual strategies and, and planning sessions happening within their different teams. So sometimes coming in thinking this is the greatest idea you need to listen, listen to me or can be challenging. So I think trying to 
find a balance in terms of how that contributes to to the overall vision has always helped in in, in terms of trying to create that get that buy in. But collaboration, and again, tying back to what we've been talking about, about around engagement, all contributes to that. Really knowing your shit, Ben, excuse my language, knowing it, believing in it and driving forward with a purpose is what get people to believe in you and your brand. And they start seeing that that passion then resonates with other people in the business. And actually, hang on, this person knows what they're talking about. Talent and people really are Again, not just sitting here bringing people in bumps in seats because that's archaic. That doesn't happen anymore. This is actually what makes us successful. And the way that we try and pinpoint, again, those nuances with identifying talent and bringing them in and retaining them is actually what makes us really successful. So there's been a lot of mind shift around that, but building those relationships, building that trust through collaborative, engaging conversations is what's made that really, really easier and sustainable in terms of moving forward but given all the well all all all, um all the changes that happen or the well it's not in 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 some areas it's not really an evolution it's more revolution what's what's going on at the moment so so how can can tech help in communicating and uh well ensuring that you guys have the have the chance have the time to to do what you like to do that's, that's talking that's, to people exactly and that's where it always gets really tricky in balancing that out because there's always the and i think in, in most teams but if i speak to recruitment and talent there's always this fight for wanting to be more proactive versus just working through the transactional operational reactive stuff on a day-to-day basis so it's really hard to juggle that so i think What's absolutely helped us is is growing that internal capability as a talent team. Again, moving away from businesses thinking, oh, well, we just need a recruiter and and they can save us costs and get people in internally, but actually building their talent portfolio internally so that there's more of a robust team looking at things like managing your ATS systems, direct outreach, headhunting, networking within the industry, building those really healthy, robust pipelines. And that becomes a bit of a united force. Um, I always think of this talent army going out there as this unified front. But it's a, I know it's a, that's a little bit creepy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, uh, as long as you conquer, then it's fine, I guess. <laughs> in a very, in a very nice way. But yeah, and I think that's what that's what gives you the edge in terms of being able to find more of that balance and being able to be more proactive. Um, digital transformation in recruitment is a huge thing. So the use of technology, um, AI driven applicant tracking systems, uh, there's chat bots now for initial candidate interactions, um, video interviews, all of these things are continuing to be on the rise. So it's literally as understanding what's fit for purpose for us as a business in terms of how we make sure that we're elevating our pitch in the industry as a preferred employer of choice, but still keeping it really personable. Ellie, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a amazing, amazing closing remarks, uh, keeping it personal. Um, that's a very cool thing to say. Thank you so much. It was, was great chatting to you. Thanks, Ben. It was really lovely to chat to you too. Um, I know the passion and the excitement comes out, but um, yeah, grateful that you're here for it. Happy that you were able to listen. Um, and yeah, really good to connect with you today. It was, was I think, uh, some words like recruiting armies. Uh, that, that's a word that, that has not <laughs> the appeared on this. title of my next book. <laughs> exactly, right? So it hasn't appeared on this podcast yet. But I really like it. <laughs> Thank you so Amazing. much. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I might get rights to it just in case it starts, you know, going out there. But yeah, you're welcome to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And thanks so much, you, Ben. Thank you. And and all of you guys, thanks for listening in. And see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.